Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today our guest is Peter Russell. Hi Peter. Hello. And Peter's written several books which I'm going to show you here now. Uh, the Brain Book, The Global Brain, Waking Up in Time and From Science to God. And today we're pretty much, we're going to hear about Peter's life and his own spiritual journey, but we're going to focus more on the last two books, the content of those, because it's very interesting and it's very relevant to what's happening on the planet at the moment on different levels. So, Peter, let's start briefly when you were young, when you were a teenager, yep. because you were, from what you were telling me earlier, you were very driven to find things out. You had a real thirst for knowledge, didn't you? Yes, in two ways. I mean, one, I sort of, I was a budding scientist. I thought, thought I'd end up as a scientist of some sort and and mathematics, I was good at math and I was doing well at school in that area. So that was the, there was a thirst for knowledge on the scientific level, but also there was an, sort of an inquiry about the nature of people. I got fascinated by sort of simple philosophical questions like free will determinism. I say simple, but I mean they're profound questions which nobody has answered, but I got drawn into those sorts of questions. So when you say free will determinism, what do you mean by that? Well, that's a basic question of, do we actually have free will, or is everything determined? I mean, we appear to make choices. You know, okay. I've chosen to be here today with you, but was that just a result of the conditioning of the way my brain responds to your invitation because of social conditioning, or did I really make a choice? Um, you know, you go to a restaurant, you choose something from the menu. Do you actually make a free choice, or is it because you had this yesterday and this one's cheaper and you don't like red meat and you don't like the flavouring? Is it all predetermined and your brain is just going through this process? And people have been debating this for thousands of years and there's still no closer to a solution. And, and you were asking these questions when you were a teenager? Yes, yeah. They're very deep questions for yeah. a teenager. Yeah. yeah, and still asking them. <laughs> And you also had a big interest in mathematics, didn't yes, you? Yes, that was my love. And I went to university, I went to Cambridge studying maths and I was actually quite good at it. I got awards for it and, and then I was actually studying with Stephen Hawking for a while. He was, right. he was my supervisor. At Cambridge, you, each student has a one-to-one -one relationship with what's called a supervisor who actually takes you through the course and you meet every week. And for a while he was my supervisor which was fascinating. He could still walk and talk and his illness was just beginning to show but he didn't even need a wheelchair. He had a walking stick and, and he could still talk. But he was fascinating. He was so funny, compassionate, lovely person. And he still is. You still see it when you see him on television or whatever. So what kind of thing did you learn from him? Um, he was doing his early work on black holes then, which he's now mm. famous. And I, I was fascinated by that. And also just how he could, he could show me the underlying equations of things. Like a lot of what I was learning at that time in mathematics was really theoretical physics and how the equations of math related to the world. And my speciality then was relativity. I loved relativity and the theory of relativity. And so part of what he was helping me on then was understanding relativity, Einstein's relativity. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think also when you were younger, you were... Frames with Einstein as well, weren't you? I've always been interested in Einstein, yes. Yeah. 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 And then at some point, an interest in meditation started at university, I think. Yes, and that really came out of my ongoing interest, sorry from the philosophical stuff, my ongoing interest in the mind and what is mind, what is consciousness. And I realised that physics was never going to answer the fundamental questions to me about why is there mind in the universe. Physics might tell me how you know, the universe began from nothing and became hydrogen, and how hydrogen evolved into the other elements and how all that evolved into galaxies and stars and why we're here. But why do we experience? Why is there mind in the universe? Physics doesn't predict that any of us should ever have a mind. It just predicts we should all work as biological automata, robots, really. Why is there consciousness? And that's the question that began to really interest me. And I actually moved into psychology, thinking that would answer the questions, and then realized that they didn't know any more about it. But I realized the people who did know about consciousness were the sort of saints, yogis in India, the monks who'd studied consciousness firsthand, which means actually exploring your own mind. And I realized meditation 
was like the scientific way of exploring your own mind. It isn't scientific in terms of you're not putting measuring equipment on a person. You can do that. But for me, it's more just observing your mind, letting the mind quieten down, and beginning to watch your mind. And that, I think, is how you really begin to explore consciousness. So that's why I got into meditation and then went out to India to study it more. I think you started first with Buddhist meditation at, uh, yes. at Cambridge and then you found the Maharishi. Yes. Miller, who was yeah. just beginning, wasn't he, in those He was days. just beginning, yes. The Beatles were getting interested in him. I didn't, yes, I, I sort of dabbled in Buddhist meditation, but at that time it didn't quite make sense to me. And TM, when I came across that, it really did because the Maharishi was emphasizing complete and utter effortlessness, which was contrary to what all the other teachers I had experienced were saying. And that just, he made sense to me in a way about not trying, about as soon as you try to meditate, you make the mind more tense. And what we're talking about is letting the mind totally relax. So what you're saying is the other meditation teachers were telling you to try hard and discipline yourself. And concentrate, focus okay. the mind. And you found that hard, or did you get results doing that? I didn't get many results from it, no. Mm -hmm. And what the Maharishi was saying is do the opposite. Let the mind totally relax. Don't try. And let the mind just become quiet of its own accord. And I found that worked. And that was just through repeating a silent mantra, I think twice a day, 20 minutes in yes, the morning and it's, evening. People say repeating a mantra. It's actually, that's slightly misleading, because it's really... If you repeat it, it just becomes a rote thing. It, but it's more being aware of the sound in your mind, just being aware of the sound. And the sound sort of repeats itself, and sometimes it doesn't. But, it, but it's awareness of the sound that's the crucial thing. It's not just, if you just repeat it, that's a sort of, that's a tradition that's used in India, but I don't think that gets you so far. But through that very gentle awareness, you're allowing the mind to settle down to quieter levels. So when you say the sound in the mind, are you talking about the mental chattering? No, no, the sound, the mantra is just a sound in the mind. So, okay, so you're focusing on the sound of the mantra. Well, you're not focusing. Okay, you're being aware of being it. Being aware of it, and that's okay. the important difference. So what's the difference between focusing and being aware? Focusing involves some effort, some control, holding the attention somewhere. Right. Whereas awareness is much more relaxed. You know, so I could say, you know, I, I, I can hear now, you know, the awareness of air conditioning in the background. I can just be aware of that. I, co I could focus on it, which means sort of intent right. listening. And it's just, it's just opening the awareness to listening. It's like listening to what's there. And so you say it's more just listening to the sound. And what did you, what did you find happened to you by doing that? The mind just begins to settle down, just becomes quieter. Normally that chatter you talk about, there's a lot of chatter, and then the chatter just gently begins to decrease, and you just become quieter. And as you become quieter, it just becomes more enjoyable, more peaceful, because a lot of that chatter is creating stress, discontent, worry, fantasy, whatever. And it's that chatter that actually keeps the mind active. And so that, that chatter just begins to die down, and you just begin to settle into a state of peace and quiet, which is naturally enjoyable. And I presume that affected you in your ordinary life as well, not just when you were meditating. Yes, and that's the idea of meditation, yes. that there's, you get in touch with that sense of ease inside and then you bring that out into life so that, you know, instead of coming at life, da, 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 what's going to do all this stuff, with that chattering mind driving you, you can just be more peaceful. But also, I think, more compassionate, because the other thing I notice is as the mind settles down, becomes quieter, you, you get in touch with the heart, with that sort of deeper sense of compassion and love. And so you can begin to relate to the world out of compassion, rather than out of the ego's needs for what the ego thinks it wants and needs. So it's shifting your emphasis as a, as a human being in a way, yes, giving it another priority or, exactly. or set of values. Beginning yeah. Yeah, it's, values, it's shifting yeah. the way you relate to the world. Yeah. And I see that's the value of meditation. It's nice, the actual practice, but the value is how it shifts your attitude to the world. And of course, just you know, having, being able to stop and have rest every day is, is valuable, just from a health point of view, I think. It, just, it de stresses you. Are you still meditating now? Yes, yeah. yeah. I've done most of my life. Yeah. Not as regular as I should be sometimes, but yeah, it's important practice. Okay, to keep the sequence going, yeah. and then you were 
very, you got very involved with the Maharishi organization and you went to India for a time, didn't yep, you? Yep, I went to study with him in India and became a teacher there in India. And that, that was fascinating for me because up until that time I sort of rejected religion. As a kid, you know, because I was interested in maths and science, it was about age 13 when I went through the process of confirmation, I just realized, for me it was deconfirmation, I realized this was a weird load of mumbo jumbo <laughs> that I was meant to believe I was meant to believe the Nicene Creed, you know, Jesus was born of a virgin, all this stuff. I thought, what? And so I just totally rejected classical religion. But what happened in India was I realized there was something not so much to religion, but to spirituality. And I realized all the different religious traditions, underneath there was the same spiritual core, the same spiritual fire, if you like, that originally gave them life. And that wasn't so much to do with rituals or you know, myths about the cosmos or whatever. It was much more psychological. It was about how we get ourselves caught in, whether you want to call it the ego or materialism or judgment, whatever, but how, we, how the mind becomes caught and how, because of that, we suffer. And every spiritual tradition, in one way or another, was aimed at freeing the mind whether you call it salvation, liberation, enlightenment, awakening, whatever. They all are aimed at sort of lightening the load so that we can actually be in touch with our true selves. And that became a fascination for me. And still is. My whole life really changed then because I got fascinated about what is this basic, core, essential spirituality that lies behind all the spiritual traditions. Mm. Huxley called it the perennial philosophy. It's that eternal philosophy that keeps coming up again and again and again. And then the other thing was realizing that this is what the world needed. So sitting in India, I sort of looked around and just saw that just about every problem there was from personal problems to big global problems, environmental, social problems, all came back to human consciousness, to the way we were thinking, mm. to the ego, to the fact we were caught in this very limited way of thinking. And we don't tend to look at consciousness. When there's a problem, we look at what to do out there. You know, so that like, you know, right now as we're doing this, you know, there's riots been going on in London. Everybody's talking about, what do we do about this? But no one's talking about, what do we do with the consciousness that's behind it? That's the real question for me. And so my life, since I came back from India, also been looking at this whole issue of how do we actually free human consciousness from the materialistic attitudes that are just indoctrinated into us really from the moment we're born. Okay, how do we? That's a good question. It's, yeah. a, it's a big question. It's a really important question. I think this is the fundamental question, yeah. I think the first step is realizing it doesn't work. The current mode doesn't work. You see, you say that and I agree with you and yet as a the consensus among human beings is we must keep trying. We must keep trying. And we we're kind of tr trying to make something that is obviously not going to work to you and me, but the majority try and make it work. Why is that, do you think? It's one of the definitions of insanity, isn't it? To keep on doing the same thing even though it doesn't work. <laughs> um, well, let's look at what it is that doesn't work. Yes. First, just to go back a step, I think what everybody is looking for in the final analysis, we're all looking to feel better. We look at whether you call it peace of mind, satisfaction, fulfillment, contentment. We want to be happy, don't we? We want to be happy. That's the bottom line. We want yeah. to feel good. We want to be happy. Yeah. And there's different words to it and there's different flavors of it. But it's basically we're looking for a better internal state of mind where we feel good. We're looking to feel good. Yes. And our culture tells us through education, through the media, through advertising, everywhere we look, that if you're not feeling good, there's something wrong. You need to get something. You need to do something. You need to experience something. And that it seems to work. You know, so we go shopping and we buy ourselves a new TV or something. And we do feel good for a very short while, but it doesn't last long. Until and then the bill comes in on the credit card. Yeah, when the, when the bill yeah. comes in. Yeah. And then we go looking for you know, some better clothing, some better shoes, or a yeah. better deal on a credit card, better software, new computer, whatever it is. And so we're caught on this treadmill, and all we get is temporary 
satisfactions, then we're looking for another one. We never find any lasting happiness, any lasting satisfaction. It's just temporary ones. And even that is an illusion because, and this is what meditation I think shows people, the natural state of mind when we're not worried, and that's what you touch in meditation, when the mind becomes quiet and you stop worrying, you find that the natural state of mind is one of contentment and peace. But then what happens is because we see some advertisement or something in the news or talk to somebody, we feel, oh, there's something missing. And as soon as we feel there's something missing, we create discontent. We, it's like, oh, I haven't got this, oh, I haven't got that. And so we're feeling dissatisfied. And so when we go and actually buy that thing, it's not that the new TV screen is making us happy. It's we are no longer making ourselves unhappy for five minutes. Yes, but isn't it also this feeling that we all have that something isn't complete? Yes. And we want the happiness, we want the happiness because we want to complete something. Yeah. And that seems to be the message that's very rarely put across. Yeah. Well, what our society tells us is you will feel complete if only you had just got this, got this, got that. And so we're on this endless chasing, and that's what Indian tradition often calls samsara, that endless chasing one thing after another thing after another. And no one's really pointing out that it's something inner that we're looking for. The completion comes not from just having the right things or right experiences, but the real completion comes through actually knowing oneself and knowing that deep inside, it's not even deep inside, just below the surface really, is that contentment, happiness, okayness that we're looking for. And so it's a complete shift in where we put our attention. So let, let, let's again go back to your, your mm -hmm. story that we were on, because yeah. I know when you were in India, you went back a second time, and you spent the second time many, many hours a day meditating. So how did that bring you more in touch? What actually happened? Because you're sitting there, presumably for hour, hour after hour, just meditating. Day after day. Day after day. I was actually doing 24-hour day meditations at one stage, yeah. So you don't even sleep? You, well, you sort of sleep, but when you're, there'd be a period for two or three hours in the middle of the night where I was sort of dozy. But you don't need to sleep. If you're leading the sort of life where you're so quiet, there's no stress, you're meditating in the day, it's almost like you're somewhere, it's, you're not sleeping, but you're, you're very quiet. You don't need sleep in those situations. So what is that like? Are you, are you in a blissful, peaceful state most of the time? Yes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I don't like the word bliss. Okay. Uh, um, well, I translate that as just unconditioned peace. That one is at peace, not because everything is okay, but there's just this quality of peace that is there. But it's not there the whole time, because the mind starts coming up with its stuff, its fantasies, what you think you need, and if only that, you begin to notice the mind coming up with all these stories, all that conditioning coming up. But now you see it for what it is. So you're seeing there's a gap. Yes. What's coming up, and you, that's aware of what's yes. coming up. You notice it, and then yeah. you, could, you begin to see it and almost laugh at it at times. Yeah. Or at other times it grabs you, it takes you over for like an hour. You get totally caught yeah. up in this thing of like, when I get back to England, I'm going to do this and this and this. Then you realize, what I've just done is all this thinking has just kept me out of my own natural state for half an hour yeah. on hour. What, like, this is crazy. Yeah. But to realize that's what we do in life. We get caught in these, I call them stories, this uh, dialogues we have with ourselves that actually, it's the story we're telling ourselves that creates the discontent, the lack of peace. And that's the big realization. It's the story we tell ourselves that takes us out of the peace. Yes. And the key, as I understand mm -hmm. it, is that you became aware that you are watching the story. So you yeah. are not the story because you're able to right. watch it. Right. Talk more about that. Yeah. And that's a fundamental thing in just about all the spiritual traditions, this thing of the nature of I, what is the self? And what, we, what tends to happen is we get identified with the story, or I, I prefer the word engrossed. We get caught up with the story that you know, I tell myself that you know, if I had this or had this better relationship, whatever it is I'm telling myself, there's an I in that story. It's like a character in a novel. 
You know, when you read a novel, there's the lead character, and you identify with that character and the character's feelings and all of that stuff. But it's just a character in a story. And it's the same with our thoughts. When we're telling ourselves some story about myself and I would feel so much better if I had this or what did I do last week or you go back to your childhood and you think about that, there's a character in the story. And that, that yeah. character is sort of real because it's there. There's, there's this me I can tell stories about. But then there's the me that's just watching the story. And that's the real me. It's not the character in the story. But what happens is we get engrossed with the story, with the yeah. character, and we mistakenly think I'm the character in the story, whereas what I am is just the awareness that's noticing the story, the awareness that's noticing me talking to you now, that awareness that is always there. I'm always aware. That's what's always there. And that's what so many spiritual teachings point to, that the real I, what we actually mean by I, it's not some individual person, character with all these qualities, but it's just that, we sometimes call it just the observer, the witness. I prefer just the, the awaring that's always there. The awaring. The, oh yeah, I, I use that because yeah. I don't like to use nouns. If we say the witness or the observer or even the awareness, we make it a thing. Okay. And as soon as we make it a thing, we bring in this sort of Objects. duality again. Yeah. There's me here, and then there's the real self. Yeah. The, or there's me here, and there's the witness. It's like, all there, there isn't a thing. There is no thing we can identify as the self. And yet, there is that which we all know so well, it's been there all our life. It's that sense of, sometimes a sense of beingness, presence. It's that knowingness. It's that which knows. And what did you find help to strengthen that process in you. Okay, you were doing the meditation for yep. many hours a day, and then it's obviously at some point you left India, you came back to the West, you had to earn a living, you had to be involved in daily life. Mm -hmm. And there's all, all these temptations, if you mm -hmm. like, things trying to pull you out of that knowingness. Yes. So what did you find, obviously you kept meditating, was there other things, other practices you did that helped you to embody that knowing more? Ah, many things, many things. Um, my practice itself has evolved over the years, and I got involved with, I found a lot of, a lot of value in Buddhist teachings, which really helped me understand the mind a lot better. Um, and I came across something called A Course in Miracles many years ago, which also was a real wonderful adjunct to meditation, because that's about in a sense, letting go of our belief systems about who we are. And in many, many times it says, you know, meditate upon this. And I think people who haven't got a practice of meditation, what do they do? But having a good practice of meditation really allowed me to get a lot of value from that. So sort of watching myself when I get angry, watching, noticing what's really going on. What am I telling myself when I get angry? And it's usually some story about how somebody should not have done what they did. And it's like yeah, something beginning, affected you. Something affected me. Mm. Somebody messed up my life because yeah. they didn't behave the way I think they should have done. They didn't really affect you. They affect you as the story, as you put right. it. Right. Yes. Yeah. They didn't affect the observer. That's yes. always there. Yeah. But there's, then there's this other bit of me. I call it the ego mind, which yeah. is the bit that's trying to be in control of things, and that gets upset because it's no longer in control because somebody's done something which has affected my life in a way I don't like. And so beginning to notice that when I feel angry, stopping, pulling back and noticing, OK, what am I telling myself here? What's the story that's going on? And by doing that, by just getting a bit of perspective and seeing the story, it doesn't grip you anymore. You don't take it so seriously. It's like, ah, oh, OK, they're like that. They did this. And what they did is in conflict with what I want. But that's the truth of what's happening. There's just this conflict in my mind between what they did and what I want. But I'm, I'm still here, and then I'm, I'm observing that conflict. And when you do that, it doesn't run you, and the anger then just dissolves. Mm -hmm. you know, I think when, when it comes up initially, the anger's very real, and I'm not saying we should never get angry. But what we tend to do as human beings is carry it on with us. For months, we hold grievances about somebody. I think the skill in life is when you get angry, OK, there, it may be there for a reason at the moment, but then rather than carrying it on for days or weeks or months by carrying on the same stories, they better stop and say, 
Just a story. Just a story. And that is often difficult unless you make the commitment to yeah. do that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. I think, yes, I think the inner journey is a commitment to, to wake up, really. We talk about awakening. It's to wake up to what is actually going on in oneself. Yeah. And you do talk in, uh, which book was it? I think Waking Up in Time, you talk about the Great Awakening. Yes. So tell us more yeah. about how you see the Great Awakening. I see this as a huge, unprecedented moment in human history. And, and we have scientific developments like never before. But we also live in a state of real vulnerability on the planet. Environmentally, we could really screw things up. And at the same time, there is this search for spirituality and realizing, I think this is becoming widespread across the planet, that the old way, the material way, that's actually leading to so many problems, leading to environmental issues, isn't actually working. It doesn't work for the planet, we're destroying the planet, but it's not working for us as individuals. We just seem to keep on going down the same road and never getting anywhere much. So I see there's a widespread search for spiritual awakening that's happening across society. When I, when I first got interested in spirituality back in the 60s, when I went to India and things, there were hardly any books on this subject. Now you, you go into any moderate-sized town and there's bookstores devoted to spirituality, consciousness, quote, new age things, I don't like the term particularly, but that whole area. And most of those books, perhaps all of them, are just, they come from people having explored themselves, done some practice, worked on something, and then wanting to share it with other people. You know, what we're doing now, Conscious TV, is the same thing. It's, you're interviewing speakers, all of whom, writers, have been on their own path over the years. They've learned something they want to share. And there's, there's thousands, millions of people on their own journey, all discovering little bits of the path, all wanting to share it with each other. It may not be as visible as books or television. It may just be sharing it with their family or in schools or at work. But there's millions of people just quietly waking up in their own way and sharing that with others. And when you get that, you get a positive feedback effect and the, the awakening begins to accelerate and happens faster and faster and faster. And so now, you know, it's huge the numbers of people engaged in this. Like in America now, they reckon something like 28 million people are engaged in some yoga practice. 40 years ago, that might have been you know, a few hundred thousand or something. And it's, it's growing, but everybody's learning from each other. And I think that is what is unprecedented, this global interest in spirituality. Beyond any particular religion, we're coming back to what is that core spirituality? And it's happening at a time that we really, really need it. And that's, what, that's why I think the Great Awakening is so fascinating and so essential. This is the time in history where we need that spiritual awakening. Because the fact we, it's the fact we haven't got it. We're coming out of this materialist, self-centered consciousness that is leading us to destruction. Yeah, on the, on the uh, other side of the scale, the kind of the, uh, the bankruptcy of life at so many different yep. levels is becoming more and more obvious. Yes. And at the same time, there's something new. There's, like, there's yep. a bud that's beginning to grow. Yeah. And it's, but it does need... It does need supporting, doesn't it? It does need supporting. And support. that's the key, and I think you, 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 you do touch on that in the book quite a lot, that somehow you've got to, every individual needs to take the positive steps that they can. Yes. Every, we all need to take responsibility for our own awakening. Nobody can do it for us. And it's easy to say, oh, they must change. But I also remember I'm one of them in other people's eyes, and I'm the only person I can really take responsibility for. But also, there's, there's a value in community. It's what, what Buddhist teachings call Sangha, the community. And you're asking, you know, what, what has helped me in my own practice? I would say one thing that's been really important is having friends who are on similar journeys. There's a support there, and it's hanging out with similar people. If you just, you know, if all your friends are totally into are they wearing the right sneakers or do they have the right case for their iPhone, if that's what's motivating them, 
that's not going to help your spirituality much. But if, if you're with people who are also interested in that journey, whether it's meditation, whether it's observing themselves, awakening their consciousness in one way or another, you're a support to each other. So I think choosing who you hang out with, who you spend time with, who your friends are, if they're on a similar, not necessarily the same path, but they're working in a similar direction, then that's really, really important. You talk also about spirit, spirituality 101. Yeah. Tell me about that. That's, we've sort of, in a way, been touching on. I use that phrase just to bring spirituality right down to earth, to get away from all the trappings, yes. all the myths. Yeah. It's really, for me, it's, it's this thing that we are, our, our true nature is one of contentment. But we screw it up because we start wanting things, looking for things, yeah. because we have this belief system that says, if only I had more, I'd be happier. And it's spiritual, Spirituality 101 is seeing that's the problem that materialistic, self-centered belief system. There's times when it's true. I mean, if you're hungry, food definitely makes you feel better. If you're cold, adjusting the temperature makes you feel better. But if you're feeling l low because of you know, self-worth or something, just going out and buying things isn't really dealing with the problem. So it's seeing that the essential problem is how we view the world, our perception of the world. And so seeing the basic spirituality is changing the way we see things. And that, to me, is what a shift in consciousness is about. A shift in consciousness is a shift in perception, a shift, we ha a shift in how we see things. So rather than seeing things through the ego's eyes, we're seeing things through the eyes, if you like, of the true self, which is much more just seeing things as they are. Are you basically optimistic in terms of humanity's destiny and future? Difficult question. Um, the way you ask it, no. I think we are going into a time of huge upheaval, challenges. And I don't know what's going to come out of it. I think we're heading into catastrophe in many ways. And that's the result of the way we've been behaving for centuries. And it's clear people don't want to change. They'd rather go on with this insane way. So I'm not optimistic about Western civilization. I think it's doomed. However, I am very optimistic about what people can become. Mm. I'm optimistic about how we can step back from what, the way we've been caught in, the conditioning, and maybe the challenges that are coming will help us step back. I think we can become much more compassionate people, much wiser people, much less materialistic people. And I think we're going to need that as individuals and as groups to steer us, steer our way through these times. It's about finding our potential, isn't it, both as yeah. individuals yeah. and as a human race. Yeah. yeah. So I'm optimistic about what human beings can become. Yes. I'm not optimistic about what this culture can become. I think it's going to, this culture is, is falling to bits. Mm. And it's like, OK, how can we be? How can we be with each other? How can we help each other? How can we care for each other? How can we act wisely in these times, mm. these very difficult times? Yeah. Well, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Huge challenge. Because it's just so many things are set up the way, the way that the financial system is set yep. up to start with. Yes. The, the consensus belief we have about reality. Yes. The, ob yeah. the object relations uh, is set yes. up. There's, there's so much set up in facing the wrong way, if you like, yeah. leading us to a blind alley, and we, we keep hitting our heads in the blind alley, yeah. and somehow it's a question of turning around, yeah. which is actually turning within, yeah. and then start to relook. Yes, and that's the shift. That sort of shift is actually quite easy. That's the shift in perception, and that's beginning to crack. We're mm. beginning to see the consensus reality doesn't really work. We're beginning to see you know, like the banking crisis from a couple of years ago, or whenever the next one's going to be, we're seeing that that, that way of looking at money is doomed. Mm. And so many people are changing in that respect. But that's the shift in consciousness. And what I'm saying is I don't think that shift in consciousness by itself will change 
all we've set in motion in terms of environmental issues and all of that. And certainly there's a lot we can do to you know, dampen down the consequences. But I think the real shifts are in ourselves and how we, how we relate to each other. And can we relate to each other as caring, loving human beings rather than what can I get from you, what can I take from you? Yes. It's more what can I give to you, how can I help you? And I think that's the transition we're going through. And this comes back to what you were saying beginning beginning of our, our interview where all the great religions actually do talk about this. Yes. They've just been interpreted sometimes in very different ways, yes. but that is the core of their teachings. Love, compassion is the core of just about every single spiritual tradition. And so how do we do that? And that's, you know, that, that's the challenge. And that's you know, the question I'm looking at now mm. in my own life is how do I develop that in myself? How do I open my heart more? How do I get more in touch with that natural love, that natural compassion, which I, I know is there, which I taste at times. It's just that sort of unconditional love, which is just sits there as part of your being, but it's so easily covered up by the worry, the anxiety, mm. the planning, all of that stuff. Mm. So that's, that's my challenge at the moment, is just opening up to that. You also, I picked up on a phrase that you used, uh, beginning, actually beginning of waking up in time, you talk about singularity, a point where the equations run out, which is a white hole in time. And I guess that's where, that's actually what we're talking about, but you're talking about that in mathematical terms with the singularity and, and mm, the equations yeah. run out. Well, what I was talking about there was the future, where yes. we're going in the future. And yes. we're all aware that the pace of change is speeding up. Things are going faster and faster. You know, now we have to get a new operating system for our iPhone every year or every six months, and you know, emails come through faster and faster. The whole of life is going faster, much faster than it was 20 years ago or 200 years ago, which is much faster than it was 200,000 years ago. So this speeding up, it's inevitable. It's a result of just making innovations. We are a creative species. We're going to keep on. Things are going to keep on speeding up. So the world in 20 years' time is going to be much faster than it is today. The world in 40 years' time, so much faster still. And beyond that, it's just going to go faster and faster and faster. And we seem to have a blind spot on the future. We seem to think that sometime it's all going to be stable and nice and the acceleration will stop. I don't see that happening. I see the acceleration is inevitable and it's going to get faster and faster and faster heading towards and that's what I call the white hole in time, this point in time where it becomes unimaginably fast by what we can think of today. But that, I see, is the, it has the potential to be the full flowering spiritual awakening of the human species. But if everything's getting faster, and the key for you has been meditation, yeah. which is in effect slowing down, how do those two things It's a stilling of the mind rather than a slowing down. It's a, it's a okay. stilling. And I think that's absolutely essential because as things get faster, it's easier to get more and more stressed, more, more caught up in what is going on. And having meditation is a way of finding that inner stability that's always there despite things going on faster and faster and faster. And so if you can stay in touch with that inner stability and if more and more people do that, then I think we can create something on a collective level which will actually see us through into something totally beyond the world we know today, totally different. And that's why I say it's a singularity, it's when the equations break down, it's going mm. to be absolutely nothing we can imagine. Unimaginable. Because it's going to be, I don't know, a totally different sort of way of operating, living in the world. And what is your feel for that? What's your instinctive feel for that? This may sound pretty weird, far out, but it's like a collective near-death experience. Well, that sounds very radical, actually. Yeah. For so the closest it's a collective near-death rather than the collective death. Well, could be both. Could be either. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what death is. All I know is when people approach death, and they have those experiences where they think they're going to die and there's that tunnel of light and what is almost universal there is people feel this incredible sense of peace, of love, of being cared for and the sense of light 
And that's what we touch into in meditation. It's just that, that sense of peace, that love that's there. There's often a sense of light in meditation. And in India, they call death Maha Samadhi, the great Samadhi. Samadhi is what you reach in meditation. Death is the great Samadhi. And it seems people who are approaching death, what they report is there is some incredible release from this mortal coil, as they often put it, release from the body, where you suddenly find everything is okay. And people who come back from that, come back, usually transformed, changed, they want to live their life differently. And, yeah, they often have healing abilities. And others who don't come back from it, we never hear from again, who knows what they, <laughs> what they go into. Yeah, I, don't, I have no right. idea. Yeah. I think we're heading somewhere similarly on a collective level. Mm -hmm. And maybe collectively we move into that and go through it into something which is totally beyond anything we can conceive of. But it's like the collective consciousness of humanity going into wherever death leads. Or it could be we go to it and it's a huge collective awakening and we come back transformed, changed. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how collective and connected they're, they're words that are similar words in one yeah. way. And we are becoming more and more connected yes. as a human species yes. through the internet and travel and information yes. and everything else. We know so much more. So the potential for being more connected mm -hmm. as a collective is there. Yes, yes. And it's that connection, I think, which is fueling the collectivity. Mm -hmm. And that's what my book, The Global Brain, was all about. I wrote that back before the internet even existed. But just seeing, because I was involved in computers for a while, just seeing the connectivity that computers were going to bring to people was so parallel to the way nerve cells link up in the brain. I saw we were going to be creating a global brain, which was going to be the linking of all the minds of humanity into a collective system. And we are moving there faster and faster and faster. I mean, the, the World Wide Web was a big step in that direction. And now the whole cloud computing thing is moving that direction. And who knows? what the leading edge is going to be in five or ten years' time. But I think that technology is going to take us into a whole new degree of collectivity, which, which we can't imagine. I mean, the one thing I've learned in all of this is not to predict the future, because we're always wrong. Yeah, um, I think that's been proved many times. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking that one of the... You told me earlier that something that really influenced you was when you read about the Gaia theory the yes. first time, James Lovelock's Gaia theory. And of course that again is very much about yes. the global brain, isn't it? Well, that's what triggered me really with the global brain. James Lovelock, this was back in the mid-70s, late 70s, and his, the Gaia theory, which is now very well known, was basic, he was basically saying the only way we can understand the, uh, all the Earth's biosystem is to think of the the totality of the biosystem, all the living systems of the oceans, the atmosphere and the soil, is functioning like one single self-regulating being. And he was producing a lot of evidence to support this. And so I was asking, well, okay, well, if that's the, if that's the case, what is humanity doing here? Because you can say, like, the oceans are like the blood, the circulatory systems, the rainforests are like the lungs exchanging oxygen. And you can almost see, you know, individual species or individual systems perform a function in this global organism. And I said, well, what is humanity doing here? Because we're, A, we're relatively new, just a few million years. Rainforests have been around a lot longer, the oceans much longer. What is it we're doing here? And I asked, what is it we're good at? And it's what human beings are good at is information processing. We have language. We can share ideas. Mm. We can learn. And we can share that across the planet. And I thought, that made me think we are like the nerve cells of the planet. We're like the individual nerve cells. And then I realized what happens in an individual when you are growing in the womb, there's this early on, about three months after you're conceived, there's this flurry of growth of nerve cells, like billions, millions being created by the second. And, but they're not connected. And then as, as the brain evolves after you're born, what starts happening is those cells all start connecting up. And it's the connectivity between the cells that produces your intelligence. You don't have any more brain cells now than you did before you were born. You had all the cells you were ever going to have, with plus or minus a few, but before you were born. 
the growth afterwards is not the growth of the number of nerve cells, it's mm. the growth in connectivity. And I realized the number of human beings on the planet is about the same sort of size as the number of cells in our brain. And what we're going through now is not, thankfully, not the further expansion of numbers that's beginning to slow now, but what we're going through is the connectivity. And we're just seeing the beginning of that. And an average brain cell may communicate directly with 10,000 other neurons. Mm. You know, we sort of send emails backwards and forwards or watch things on YouTube or, or on some social network. But where that's going is going to be unimaginable. We, we can't imagine the future. Mm. This, this is so key, this thing about realizing the connectedness of us all, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Not just as human beings, but as a planet. Yeah. The key thing is the oneness of creation, the oneness yeah. of yeah. everything. Yeah. And I think, for me, the, the connectivity I'm really interested in, is, or the oneness, is deep down inside us, we're all the same. You and I have very different histories, different personalities, different interests. Deep down inside, we all want the same thing. We all want that quality, whether you call it peace, happiness, contentment. We all want to feel okay. Completion, I call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we all want love. We all want to be loved or to experience love. It's a fundamental thing. And so when we recognize we're already one in that way, everybody I meet, whatever they are, whoever they are, whatever they're doing, ultimately they want exactly what I want. Mm. And that to me is the key because if we can relate in that way, and so rather than saying, I want this, how can I get it from you, is to say, you want the same as me, how can I give what you want? So how can I communicate with you, com share with you in such a way that you feel good, that you feel loved? And that to me is is part of the challenge. It's not always easy because you know I have my own conditioning and stuff and needs and I may fall out of that very often and start accidentally being nasty to you but it's not my real intention. Yeah. And I think if we recognize that we, that's a unity we all have in terms of that deep fundamental goal we all have to be at peace, to be loved, if we can interact knowing that and trying to give that to each other then I think that's what helps the world change. I'm just thinking that, you know, we just put the context that we you know, mentioned earlier, we just had that these riots in England yeah. and they've been quite serious and it's been challenging for people that are very involved in them. And it's brought out the good in one way that people, after they took place, wanted to get together to help support people that had suffered and yeah. clean up the streets and things. But it took a perceived enemy to bring people together, and you yeah. hear that I, I, I've never experienced being and being living in wartime, but you hear there was a great spirit when there was a common enemy, yeah. yes. And somehow we need to find this spirit, maintain this spirit without having an enemy, don't we? Yes, because the yeah. enemy is division that's still right. supporting the duality and, yeah. and the struggle that we all have, yeah, yeah. And I think we're well, often it needs something like the enemy to, to galvanize us because suddenly there's the need that pulls that there's some need that we're all come to. And it needn't necessarily be the enemy of other, other people. You look at you know, what happens when there's major floods or something. Again, people come together. It's not that the mm. flood is an enemy, but there's a major something that needs collective attention mm. and that pulls people together. There's that collective goal. We're, we're all trying to do the same thing together. And I see this comes back to the, what I call the Great Awakening. It's saying we all want this process of becoming more in touch with ourselves, of awakening more. And so that becomes a collective effort. How can we help each other do that? Mm. There's one, one quote that I've pulled out of your, uh, one of your books. Um, Through us, the universe can fulfill the purpose of its design. Can you explain that a little more? I don't know how many hours we've got left. <laughs> we've got five and a half minutes left. <laughs> that should be a very brief pricey of it. Um, there's a lot of evidence coming out of science and cosmology at the moment that the universe seems to be very finely tuned. If you change any of the fundamental constants, it doesn't work. Make the force of gravity a bit stronger, a bit weaker, it all falls apart or, or never gets going into galaxies. And there's, that's why I say, an, an hour or two I could explain all this to you. But 
this leads to the view that either the universe is a most preposterous accident, that it actually works, or there's some sort of intention to it. And those who think there's some sort of intention, that doesn't mean to say there's an intender. Let's be careful. Yes, I understand. It's not yep. that there's an intender, yep. but that there is a direction. You could say this, when, when a child gets conceived, there is a direction. If things unfold, then that fertilized egg grows into a little fetus, which becomes a human being, which is born and grows up. There's that direction. And so what they're saying is there's the direction, there's an inevitable direction to evolution, and everything is set up so that this direction can happen. And what that direction is, is actually one of increased awareness, increased consciousness, increased knowing. And so there's a growing body of scientists who say the purpose of the universe, they don't like using the word purpose, but you know, the direction of the universe is knowledge, is that the universe is here to know itself. And I think at this point in human history, on this little tiny planet out on the, you know, the outer edge of some galaxy, we are the ones who are coming to that point of knowing the universe. And we're, in terms of physics, you know, we're getting close to that unified field theory. Maybe in another 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, we will actually understand the cosmos. Maybe we won't, but I think we're heading in that direction. The area we don't understand yet is the mind. Mm. That is still very mysterious. And that, again, is why I think the interest in consciousness, spirituality, meditation, self-observation is so fascinating and it's moving ahead so fast that we are now beginning, just beginning to understand ourselves. And when we understand ourselves to the same depth that we're now beginning to understand atoms and quanta and quasars and all of that, when we understand ourselves in the same way, then I think the universe in us in this little corner of the universe, will have come to its fruition, it come to its full knowing. So it's another example of how we need to bring our attention from the outside, materialism, objects, back yeah. to inside, yeah. meditation, looking, understanding. Yeah. We've become incredibly proficient at using the material world. We become masters of the material world. This is mm. not complete, I mean, it gets us back, but you know, we become very proficient there. But the mind is still very dim, and that's, that's where we need the knowledge now. That's where we need the mastery, is in mm. our own selves. And that's what, to me, makes these times so exciting. And all this interest in spirituality and what Conscious TV is all about, it's all about fostering this inner awakening, this inner learning about ourselves. And that, to me, is the most important thing we can be doing, and the most critical thing we can be doing at this time. Mm. Well, we're doing our best here at Conscious TV. Good I know for you're you. Working hard and you're doing your best. In and your there's millions yeah. of others yeah. doing their best. That's yeah. what's so great. It yeah. isn't you or me. We are just members of a team of millions and millions of people, each doing the best in their own way to facilitate this, this yeah. shift. We need to finish now. I really appreciate you coming in and talking with us, Peter. I'm Thank just, just going to show the uh, Please do. in front of the camera. So was the global brain which we talked on talked about briefly the brain book which we haven't really covered but is very interesting the science of god which is peter's story to some degree um, and also goes in some depth on meditation and waking up on time which a lot of the interview was about in one way so thanks again peter for coming in thank you very much for watching conscious tv I feel in a way in the interview we just got started towards the end, but uh, we still covered a lot during that time, and um, I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.